thank you for having me back. And I'm looking forward to our time together. And uh, as I introduce this, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew 4. And uh, we're going to be there in, in just a minute. And uh, for my part of this series, I'm going to talk about hope. Now, if you were here last year, don't be nervous. And you say, wow, he's going to bring the same six lessons we heard last time. This guy's stuck on something. <laughs> Uh, I have just found that over these past few years how much uh, as Christians we really need encouragement to get through the various things we endure in life. Uh, and so uh, I have a myriad of these and I only gave you six last time and so I've got a lot more to be able to uh, share with you. And, and last year was a lot about hardships. We talked a lot about trials and difficulties and facing uh, those various things and how they come at you in life. And uh, this year is going to be much more about just living the normal aspects of life and what comes to you, uh, not when you're in, this, in the middle of a trial, but just like tonight, talking about hope when, when tempted and dealing with just what happens with the normal course of, of life. So uh, for my part, we'll be talking about hope, and I'm looking forward uh, to, to this time with you. And as I said, I really appreciate uh, this time together. Uh, well, I, one of the things to start off with is just asking the question, uh, why do we fail at temptations? Why, why do we struggle? Why is it such a hard time to uh, find victory in temptations? I, I suppose if you're like me, there are a number of areas in your life where you can just start feeling like, uh, I'm never going to get any better at this one. It's just constantly a struggle. It's constantly a problem. It constantly trips me up. And one of the things that I wanted to be able to talk about in this is sometimes I think the reasons why that we struggle with uh, temptations is because we often don't get underneath the temptation. We don't get to the root cause. We often can look at the symptoms and try to address those, but, but don't really get under what is ultimately uh, the temptation, what is ultimately tripping us up. And so that's what I wanted to look at is in Matthew 4. Now, if you've grown up in the pews and, and you've gone to Matthew 4, and here's the temptations of Jesus. And so I know what you're going to say, Brent. You're going to say, you know, when you're tempted, you need to go to the Bible because Jesus quoted the scriptures three times. And so we need to be, know more about our Bible. And I'll, we can just go ahead and get on to Eric and be done and, be done and move on. And, and I, I want to put forward to you that I think that is really missing why this text is here. And what Jesus is doing in this temptation sequence uh, as he overcomes is really instructive to us about what is really underneath temptations and how to get under those sins and those temptations at their root. And so that's what we're going to be talking about uh, here th this evening out of, out of Matthew 4. Uh, you'll notice that, you, of course, you have three temptations. Matthew chapter 4, and verse 1 uh, begins, And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I bet. Uh, 40 days and 40 nights. I, I know I couldn't do 40 hours and 40 minutes is probably a test of, for me. 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine? And it's important to imagine the condition that he's in. Just imagine... 40 days. I mean, we, we have like studies like you're, you're barely getting by physically as a human being after uh, so many days like that. This is quite a struggle, quite a, a position that he's in at this point. And you're told in verse 3 that the tempter says, well, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And I don't know if you're like me, but I've read that and just got, what is really the big deal? I mean... Yeah, go ahead and make some bread. I mean, what, 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 you could have done that the day before even, right? Just go ahead and take care of yourself, make some bread, whatever it takes, and, and survive out there in the wilderness. What would have been such the big deal? Even if the, the tempter hadn't come to him and said this, is it really such a big deal for him to go ahead and take care of himself and make a meal and, and go ahead and enjoy out there? What is going on in this temptation that makes it such a big deal? 
And Jesus' answer helps us get a, a sense of what's going on ultimately underneath this temptation because it really has nothing to do with bread. It has nothing to do with eating. It has nothing to do with can Jesus be out there and have a meal or not. His answer is interesting because it says in verse 4, here's his answer. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. His answer is, we do not live by bread alone. Now, when I read that, I go, you know, I'd like to discuss that with you. Uh, actually, <laughs> we do. Uh, if we don't eat, we're not going to survive. So, Jesus, I'm not sure if you've got science down yet. I don't know if you figured this out, but to say that humans do not live on bread alone, I'm not sure you're understanding that, yeah, actually you do. What is Jesus trying to do when he, he brings this out? I think it is interesting to note that in each of these uh, responses to the temptations that Jesus deals with, he goes back to Deuteronomy. And the reason why Deuteronomy is important is in Deuteronomy, you have Moses giving his final sermon. He gives multiple sermons in that book. And what Moses is doing is essentially explaining, here are all the reasons why you failed catastrophically and what you need to do when you get into the promised land. Here's all the mistakes you made when you were in the wilderness. Here's the things that happened. Don't forget what happened to your parents in that first generation and why they fell and how they fell. And when you keep that in mind, then when you go into the land, then here's what you need to do so that you will be successful and enjoy the blessings of God. And so when we look at these quotations, I want you to know that it's coming from a perspective of Moses showing how Israel failed in their time in the wilderness. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and in verse 2. Here's where Moses says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So here Moses gives a very important message that is critical in our understanding of what Jesus is trying to do. Moses says, so here's what happened when you were in the wilderness. You were out there those 40 years, and the reason you were out there is that God was testing your heart. He was looking to see if you would keep his commands or not. And so he lets you hunger, and he fed you with manna because he wanted to make you know something. Notice what he says, he wanted to make them know. God wanted to make the people of Israel know that man doesn't live, people do not live by bread alone, but they live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The message that Moses is communicating to Israel is that your life was not in your hands. And what I mean by that is when Israel was put in the wilderness, God was not trying to make it like a survivor contest like we have on TV. Let's see if Israel can make it out there. They're going to be without water for three days, and let's see if they can, you know, construct some bamboo and leaves and catch some water, and, they, and then they'll be able to take care of themselves. Oh, three days went by. I guess they couldn't figure it out. I better go ahead and get them some water. And then 30 days goes by, and the people are complaining, we have nothing to eat. And God going, well, I wish you would have figured out, you know, how to eat coconuts or whatever. They could probably scrounge up around there, catch an animal, whatever it is. God is making a point here. He says, the reason I put you in the wilderness and let you hunger was to try to teach you something. And the thing that I was trying to teach you was that you weren't surviving because of your own abilities. You didn't make it through the wilderness because you were so tough or you were so smart or you were so, had such great ingenuity in engineering out there to make, get, catch your food and get the water. I wanted you to learn in the wilderness that I take care of you. That's why I put you in that circumstance. I mean, you think about that. God could have given them water on day one. 
he, he, he could have had manna come on day one. Why wait a month? except to get the people to understand, is that it's not by living by what we see or what we do, but directly by God's provision. And that's ultimately what Jesus is saying here to Satan, is he is responding and saying, the reason I don't have to make bread for myself is because I know that God is going to provide for me. That's why I'm here. I'm in the wilderness. It's not me and my own survival skills for 40 days in the wilderness. Let me see if I can make sure I can take care of myself, take matters into my own hands, make sure I've got control of the circumstance and and, and make sure I get through. He's saying, no, here's what I know. We don't live by our power and ability and might and skill. We live because God says so. And that was the point Moses was making to Israel. Did God tell the people of Israel, what I'm going to do is take you out of Egypt and let you die in the wilderness? No, the message that God communicated was, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. What did that mean? I'm going to take care of you in the wilderness. You don't have to worry about it. I've got you taken care of. Was the prophecies of Christ that Jesus is going to come and he's going to be born, he's going to exist, and he's going to die in a wilderness? No. (laughs) Prophecy is he's going to lay down his life. He's going to give it on a tree. He's going to lay it on a cross. And so he knows that God is going to take care of him. And that is the imagery that is being given to us. Now, why is this so important with temptations? Well, I would like for you to consider that how many temptations that we face that ultimately boil down to our need to trust God to take care of the circumstance. How many temptations are our desire to go, I don't think God is going to take care of this need, this desire. I'm going to do it myself. And I'd bet you'd say a lot. (laughs) There are a lot of temptations that ultimately boil down to that kind of situation, is thinking, I've got to take care of this. I'm going to do this. I mean, think about just, let's start with our emotions. And you start talking about, like, showing anger. You know, well, I'm going to take care of that. You know, they did something wrong, and so I'm going to be the one to administer justice. I'm not going to wait for God to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it. I've got to be the one to take control. I've got to take charge. I've got to solve the problem. I'm going to make right, rather than letting God, rather than not exhibiting outbursts of wrath, slander, malice, things like that. How about when it comes to anxiety and worry? I'm going to talk about that in a, in a couple of nights, somewhere in there. I don't remember what I sent you. It's somewhere in there one of those days. We're going to talk about that. What's, what's anxiety and worry coming from? I'm going to take care of it myself. I don't believe that God's got it. I've got to do it. I've got to take control. I've got to be the one to provide for me. Sexual immorality, same thing. Well, i got to fulfill my desires. I've got to get what I need and what I want. I can't do it the way God says to do it. I've got to do it how I want it. God's not going to give me what I need. He's not going to provide. I need to provide. So many temptations boil down to this point. And I want for you to think about, we are going to fall with every temptation if we think that we have to take care of ourselves. Every temptation that comes, if you think you have to take care of you, then you will fail every time. And that's what Jesus is responding. Jesus is responding by saying, I don't live because I have to take care of myself. I live because God is going to take care of me. God's got this. Even though it's been 40 days in the wilderness. Now, after 40 days, who among us would think, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Lord, are you going to take care of me? Uh, 40 days. We're, we're, we're cutting razor thin edge here. <laughs> you know, are you going to step in? Remember, that's what Israel was doing. 30 days. I, I, we might need to, you know, find a new leader and go back to Egypt. This isn't working out. We need to take control of the circumstance. And that's what's being brought out here by Jesus, is that 
One of the reasons why we fail in our temptations is because we ultimately do not believe that we do not live by bread alone. That we do believe that we live because of what we are able to do. And we don't look at it as, well, I have what I have because God gave it to me. And I enjoy what I enjoy because God gave it to me. And the reason I'm going to be able to get through tomorrow is because God says so. And the reason you just took a breath is because God said so. That God is over all of this. And so often we put it into our hands and we think we're in control and we're in charge of all of that. I'm sure I mentioned it last year. To me, COVID in 2020 is going to be one of those pivotal things that we shouldn't forget, that should remind us for all the control that we think we have over our destinies, our future, and our abilities, that should have completely broken that. Everything you think you have power over, you really don't have. And God wanted to show us all of that and go, yeah, you you can't even control toilet paper inventory. You have control over nothing. You think you have so much control. You don't have control over anything. You live by the word of God. You don't live by your power. Jesus gets that. And Moses tells Israel, you missed that. That's why you fell in the wilderness. You forgot that, be, that is only that God keeps you going. God sustains, God provides, God gives you what you need. Second temptation, verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone. I think the temptation is ultimately show yourself. Let's see the power of God in your life being displayed. In verse 7, Jesus says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I think this is interesting because you have a picture in this temptation of trying to show that Jesus is the Son of God. Throw yourself off this pinnacle of the temple and we are going to watch angels come rushing in and bear you up. And I suppose that probably would have happened. That would have been pretty neat. Pretty great display. This will show he's truly the Son of God. And Jesus' answer is very interesting because, again, you will note that he quotes from Deuteronomy, and it says there in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and and verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. And then verse 17, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. Now, do you remember what happened at Massah? Now, uh, you remember that goes back to Exodus chapter 17, and this is the place that was called Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, this is probably a really important point that is easily missed when it comes to the time when they are in the wilderness and they're complaining about how they do not have water to drink. And the observation of Exodus 17 is really important because notice the complaint is not, oh, we don't have water and we're really concerned about that because we're all feeling very thirsty. It's much deeper than that. Notice that it says there, because they tested the Lord. Now, how did they test the Lord? Is the Lord among us or not? You see what they were saying? Here we are in the wilderness, and we don't believe that God is really with us. And if he is really with us, then he needs to do something. He needs to show his power. Show it by doing something so that we can know he is here. And that is what they're quarreling about. That's what they're fighting over. And I want you to see that, that they're get, having this very issue of, it's not about water, but trying to test to demonstrate if God is really here or not. Now, this is, I think, important to think about in terms of Israel at the time. Had God shown Israel his power so that they would know that he was with them? 
I mean, we're only in Exodus 17 at this point. <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've barely come out of Egypt. We've crossed the Red Sea. Uh, we have had an enormous display of, of God's power. We've had the power of what Aaron has been able to do with his miracles. You have the power of the 10 plagues that were on display, not only for Israel, but for all of Egypt. And then culminating with the Red Sea crossing, which then caused the destruction of the Egyptians who were pursuing behind. Here is God who has shown his power and his display of greatness and love for his people by rescuing them by a mighty hand. And now what are the people saying? Is God with us or not? (laughs) Is God really with us? If he is, then you know what he needs to do? He needs to give us some water, give us some food, give us some... So is God with us or not? And that is what Jesus is now dealing with in this temptation. What Jesus is trying to deal with here with them is trying to get them to understand that here is the, the situation as Satan says, now do this great display and have him show his power. You jump off the temple and we'll just have all the angels come and it will show that God is really with you. It'll show who you are. You can prove that you are the Son of God in this great moment. Now, when you think about that kind of testing, that kind of circumstance, I want you to think about how that really is a temptation that we face. And it's probably not as direct as something like Satan said to Jesus, or perhaps even as much as what you think about with what Israel faced. But I want you to think about how many times you can be in a circumstance in your life where you feel like God needs to show himself here. God, if you're with me, you need to do fill in the blank, right? I need you to do And we can even be that way with our prayer life. God, you've got to do, this is what I need. If if I'm here with you, then this is what needs to happen. You've got to do this. This has got to be the answer. You have to give me this or fulfill that or solve that or whatever it is that's in your mind at your moment. If you will do this, then I'll know you're with me and then I'll be fully committed to you. But you've got to respond like this for me. That's ultimately what this temptation is all about. The temptation is not, okay, we'll jump and is it wrong to have angels lift Jesus up? The question is, do you need God to do something for you, to display his power for you yet again? What does he ultimately need to do on your, for your life? And that's why I asked the question ultimately this way. Essentially, The temptation is, what kind of demand are you going to put on God? What do you expect God to do? Maybe I'll put it this way. Sometimes we might think, well, I don't really put demands on God. But what should God do for your life? You know, well, I'm trying to be righteous. I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm trying to seek him. You know, he needs to... You know, I need to find a good spouse and and he should give me a good job and, you know, live in some place where I want to live and good paycheck and as many kids as I want and a white picket fence and, you know, what, just go through your mind or what are your expectations of what your life should look like, what God should do for you? Because that's ultimately what the temptation is about. The temptation is, is trying to determine Does God owe something to you? Or to put it in another direction, has God wronged you? Should God be doing something on your behalf that you think should have happened that he hasn't done? And the reason why I think that is an often a problem and why that's a part of our temptation challenge is it is a question of do we really trust God to provide, to take care of us, to give us what we need, or we need him to do something more? Is there something else he needs to do? I know you've done all this, but I just need one more. 
That's what's so interesting about Israel. Isn't that not why when we study the wilderness wanderings and you're like, well, how many miracles do you guys have to see before you believe that God is with you, that he has not left you, he's not forsaken you, he's on your side, he's caring for you, he's providing for you. How many times does it have to happen? But friends, that question can be absolutely asked to us. You know, here, if we're Israel, Israel in the wilderness was supposed to be able to look back to the Exodus, to the Ten Plagues, to the Red Sea, and say, because of that event, I know that God is with me. I don't need to challenge God. I don't need to test God. I don't need to say, well, God's got to do one more thing, and then I'll believe. One more thing, and then I'll trust him. One more thing, and, and, and then I'll be happy. But rather, what we have in our lives is the cross as the greatest display. That's what Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 is saying. God has proved or demonstrated his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died. That's supposed to be the pivot moment that you never again have to wonder, is God with me or not? That is your one monumental moment that just stands before you and says, the cross tells you he's with you. He cares about you. He loves you. You don't need to take matters into your own hands. You don't need to fulfill those desires. You don't need to go into sin. You don't have to worry about those things because God is absolutely with you. But it's easy for us to sometimes think, well, God shouldn't have done whatever it is, fill in the blank, in your life. Whatever bad thing happened, whatever degree of suffering, whatever the trial is, whatever the hardship, whatever the calamity, that shouldn't have happened. And that's why I put up there, so has God wronged you? Or to put it another way, what does God owe us? That we would stand before God and say, there is something you have to do for me. And I think it's an amazing picture of Jesus who's saying, I, you don't need God's display of power again. I know God's with me. I don't need to jump off a temple to prove that God is going to be with me and rescue me and deliver me. I don't need to do that. I know he's with me. I'm not going to put the Lord your God to the test. No reason to do that. Not even a, a, a thought. And so do we trust God or do we think God needs to do something more for us? And I hope you'll be honest with that question. As I think sometimes we have an expectation of what God is supposed to do for our lives that causes us then to hold back and fail when God doesn't seem to do what we want him to do. All right, now the final temptation. You'll notice in verse 8, and then all three of these really come together beautifully. Verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to me, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Now, this one seems quite a bit easier. You can't worship anybody but God, right? Okay, straightforward. We can just move right on. But that's not as simple and straightforward as we might think that it is. I think it is easy to acknowledge, Okay, I'm not supposed to worship any other God. But that's not that easy when you're in the midst of temptations and trials. When things are tough, it's not that simple. It sounds good when things are good. Okay, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to worship anybody but God. But imagine it now in the time of difficulty, in the time of temptation and hardship. And that's ultimately what, what Jesus is being presented with. Now, this could be, quotation probably falls in a number of other places that you see in the scriptures. The Lord is God, you're not supposed to worship any other gods. But again, the reference point comes from Deuteronomy and the failure of the people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. All right, I want us to think about this temptation for a minute. Because what Moses here is doing is reminding them of the golden calf incident of Exodus 32. 
He's reminding them, you can't go after other gods. You can't have that failure happen. Please think about what Israel did in Exodus 32 in that golden calf situation. Did they just say, you know what, we don't believe in God anymore. We don't care about about Yahweh. We would rather have this animal and we're just going to bow down and worship it. That's not what they do. I mean, Aaron is amazing in his response. When the people go, this, this Moses, he's been gone up on the mountain all this time, and we don't know what happened to him. And Aaron goes, okay, well, give me all your gold. We'll throw it in the fire. And according to him, when he explained himself, out jumped a calf. Okay. And he puts it all before him. And remember what he says. Behold your God who brought you out of Egypt. They're not rejecting the true and living God. What they're saying is, now we have something we can see. And do you remember what it tells that the people did next? Then they rose up, ate and drank and played. To which God has to tell Moses, you, you better get down there because uh, they're making a mess of things in their sinfulness. What are they doing? We have a God that we can see. Here's, here's the idea. We can worship God and still do whatever we want to do. Sure, we, we're worshiping the true and living God. We're, yeah, we're right here. And, and now we're, we're free to do as we please. And Moses is saying, no, you can't do that. You can't have these other gods, these other idols, as if you can do whatever you want to do. But our great temptation that comes to us is that we want a God that we can see that lets us do what we want to do. It's probably one of the biggest reasons why there's so many religions and so many churches and so many groups because there's got to be somebody out there that'll let me do what I want to do and still call it worshiping God. That's what everybody wants. That's what Moses is, is, is warning to them. And I think you have Jesus making such a, an important point here. I'm not going to fulfill my desires and bypass the suffering that God has me on to be able to say, I still worship God, but to accomplish my will. Did you notice what the temptation was? Notice in, in, in verse in verse 9, he will, all these I will give you. Give you what? Verse 8, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. How was Jesus going to become king and have authority over all the kingdoms of the earth? The cross. Satan's saying to Jesus, you can bypass the pain. You can bypass the suffering. Why go that path? I'll give you everything you need. Sure, you, yeah, worship God, whatever. Worship God and do this and you'll have exactly what you're looking for. And that's why Jesus is saying, you can only worship the Lord your God and him you shall serve. It's not so much as, no, I'm not going to bow down to you, but it's far deeper than that. I can't bypass what, the way God wants me to go to fulfill my desires. That's ultimately what's at stake here. That Jesus is going to be able to have what he wants if he'll just follow his will and make his own desires his priority. And so often that's, that's our mentality. I will live my life my way and God will be okay with that. That is a huge temptation. We secretly make those decisions in our minds in temptation. God's not going to really care if I do. It's fine if I have this, right? If I just do this little thing, that, it's going to be fine. Nobody's going to notice. Nobody's going to care. And friends, that's the ultimate epitome of worshiping another God. I think we can fool ourselves into thinking, oh, we don't have idols because, you know, if you walk into the back of my closet, there's not some stone statue standing there, and you're, okay, we don't have an idolatry problem. The idolatry problem is when I say, I'm going to do what I want to do, and God's going to be okay with that. God's going to be okay with that. I'm going to make that decision. He's okay with that. He doesn't care. It doesn't really matter. And I think it is so important that we just remember that we cannot bypass God's will by doing what we want and to meet our own needs our own way and then still say that we're followers of God. And yet that's such a great temptation. Is God's going to be okay with my Monday through Friday because I'm here on Sunday, you know, and I'm 
doing my thing. And so whatever else I do, you know, that, that's all right. All right, so here's what I want to bring in for how we can have hope in the midst of this and looking at what Jesus uh, has accomplished in this picture. Number one, I want you to see that Jesus is able to succeed against these temptations. Number one, he knew that his, his life was in God's hands. He just deeply understood that. He understood that his life was in God's hands. If, if we could get into our minds that we do not live by the power of our own provision and skill set and might, but is because of God and his blessings, that would be a huge step in going forward and fighting temptation. I am going to rely on God because God is the reason I, why I'm right here. And God is going to take care of those desires. He's going to take care of those needs. And I don't have to bypass him. I don't have to ignore him in that. I can do as he's asked me to do. Number two, you see Jesus is succeeding because he knew that God was with him. And I hope that we would always be aware of that when a temptation comes. God is with you. You don't need another display of his power to believe that he cares for you, that he loves you, that he is with you, and that he's going to help you. In fact, it is so fascinating to me that as soon as these are over, you note that in verse 11, that display ultimately happens, is that it says the devil leaves and angels come and are ministering to him. He was right in his trust. He was right in his belief that God is going to care for him and God is going to provide for him. And then number three, because he knew that worshiping God means doing his will, not following his own desires. I'll leave you with this big idea. Every temptation ultimately challenges us of whether we are trusting God or not. That's what is underneath every temptation. Whatever the sin is, if you want to go from sexual immorality to outbursts of wrath and anger, hatred, any of them, ultimately all of those boil down to this important challenge. Do you really trust God in this circumstance or not? Do you trust God to take care of you? Do you trust God to provide for you? Do you trust God to take care of your needs? And one of the great things that we see is that Jesus provides this great victory from these enslaving temptations. That's why he's come. That's what this whole scene is about. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll think about, did Jesus really become tempted in every way as us? And I hope Obviously, these were not the only three things that he was tempted. I think he had so many more. But I want you to see, when you get underneath a temptation, he is tempted in the exact same way. It is ultimately about a trust position. Do you trust that God's got you? Do you believe he's going to take care of you tomorrow? Do you believe he's going to provide for your future? Do you think that he cares enough about you to give you what you need? Do you really believe that he can get you through the moment you're in right now? Do you think that he will help you through whatever the crisis is or whatever the good time is, whatever it is that's going on? Do you really believe that he can take care of you? Or do you need to take matters into your own hands and do it yourself? Let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll take a break. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, Temptations are so difficult. And Lord, it can feel like we are catastrophic failures to the repeated sins, repeated failures as temptations come our way. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our resolve and strengthen our hearts to see who you are. Lord, help us to see that you are a God that can be trusted. Lord, help us to be reminded how you have cared for us every step of the way, how you have brought us to this place in our lives, and that we can continue to trust you in the days ahead. Lord, thank you for the great display of the cross and the sacrifice of your son so that we can know how deep your love is for us. And God, forgive us for how often we stray into our desires thinking 
that we can worship you and fulfill our desires at the same time. And so, God, forgive us of it. And, Lord, my, my prayer is that as future temptations come, that we would see that you are challenging us to believe in you and not in ourselves. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll take an intermission. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. It's been uh, good to reconnect with some of you tonight. I see some faces here that when I lived in Tennessee, I uh, got to know you guys, had lots of positive conversations, interactions with you. Even some of you guys in Cookville are now here. Um, and so it's, it's been a, a blessing just to already be here um, and to be able to spend this time together. I'm looking forward to the next few days. Um, being around uh, Brent and Barry, uh, having been with Barry for a few years when I was here, uh, learned so much from him and continue to learn from him and from Brent. And so uh, I, I'm going to try to say some stuff that I didn't learn from them. But if, if I did learn it from Barry, he's probably forgotten it at this point. So, so we should be okay. <laughs> Um, my, the, the first three lessons that I'm going to be doing in this series is going to focus on different passages or ideas from Scripture that say something about what our purpose is. <clears throat> and these are things that have affected the way that I think about what my purpose is as a Christian, and I want to be able to share some of these things together. Uh, this passage that we're looking at tonight, though, this was recently assigned to me for a VBS that I was doing at another church, and uh, the church was doing different things with, with kids, and then I had to sort of like match the same character that the kids were studying in the adult class. And so I was assigned to talk about Mary, and I had never done a sermon on Mary before. And for me, there's certain passages and people in the Bible that for a long time I, I would think about, and the only thing that I could tell you about these people or these passages is what it doesn't mean. And for a long time, Mary was like that for me until I was assigned this sermon pretty recently. And it got me thinking more in terms of, well, what can I learn proactively about Mary? What, what does she say about my purpose? Because she's always been somebody that I didn't really feel like I could relate to in any way. And rather than just tonight talking about all the things that are not true about her that, that people have said in misguided ways, I want us to think about this first time that we read about her in Scripture and what this says about what her purpose was and what this says about what our purpose is. And so let's go ahead and read this text in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin na virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David." And he will reign over his house of Jacob, the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. <clears throat> As we begin to approach this text, I want to say a couple things about the historical context of what we're looking at. If you notice in verse 26, the first thing that we see about the historical context is that this is taking place in the sixth month. And you, okay, well, it's the sixth month of what? 
Uh, Towards the end of the text, we see once again that the sixth month is brought up, and it's referring to the sixth month of the pregnancy of Elizabeth, that Elizabeth is in her sixth month. So notice that this story is bracketed by reminding us of the story that was right before this, where you have Elizabeth and Zechariah, and they're advanced in age, and they haven't had any children. I want to I show you um, the connections between these two stories, because I think as Luke is inviting us to compare and contrast these two couples. So you've got Mary and Joseph, and Ze- Elizabeth and Zechariah. In both stories, the angel Gabriel visits them with news of a child that's going to come to them. Uh, But you look at some of the differences where uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah from a priestly line, pretty important people. There's nothing said about Mary's lineage. Uh, The angel comes to uh, Gabriel and Elizabeth Elizabeth and Zechariah in Jerusalem, really important place. But then Gabriel goes to Nazareth, which is really an unimportant place by earthly metrics. The first couple's barren and older, like they're not going to have kids. The other couple is betrothed, and they would be on the verge of having kids whenever they get married officially. Zachariah is going to have some doubts, but Mary's going to trust. And we'll we'll say more about that one particularly uh, later on in this lesson. But notice how wildly different both of these couples are. And in both cases, God is going to be using these couples for the things that he wants to usher in in this time period. But notice something else about the time period that we're looking at here. The Gospel of Luke begins in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, by saying, in the days of Herod, king of Judah. Which might be some words that just, to us, put, put a historical context or a time period when this happened. Look, this is when it happened, and this is really interesting to know that it was around these years, probably. That's really not, I don't think, why this is said here. In the days of Herod are words that are very easily read over in our culture today. Who was Herod? Herod was a wicked, wicked man, set in place by the Romans, not even fully Jewish, part Edomite, one of the most insecure leaders that perhaps the Jewish people ever had, married ten times, had 43 children. Some of his wives he killed. Uh, some of his children he had killed for fear that they were going to take his throne. So when this text opens up, the Gospel of Luke opens up by saying, in the days of Herod, these are dark, ominous days. But what's happening in this text that we're looking at in this lesson is like if there's dark clouds hovering over the nation of Israel, there's sun rays piercing through the dark clouds now. Because what's happening here is the expectation of a coming king is starting to be fulfilled. Uh, Back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, it says this to King David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God is promising to David that there's going to come somebody from your bloodline who's going to establish this throne forever. And this is what the Jews, if the Jews were going to Sabbath school every Saturday and they were learning about the promises of God, they would have been putting their hope in dark days like this. They would be putting their hope in this one that was to come. By the way, can you imagine living in a time with corrupt political leaders? I know it's hard for us to imagine that, but think about in our culture right now, where do sometimes even we as Christians put our hope? It, it Maybe this guy can win, or it better not be that person. We put our hope in, poli- in earthly political leaders. Look what the Israelites were supposed to put their hope in. This one to come in the bloodline of David. And in this text, we have a couple references to King David. In verse 27, Mary is betrothed to Joseph, who is from the house of David. And if they have a child together, then it's going to, well, and this child's not going to actually be together with Joseph, but Joseph is going to be supposed to be his father, as he would adopt him, I guess. But Luke 3.23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, making him in the line of David. Um, Also in verse 32, when the angel comes to Mary, she says you're going to give birth to a son and he's going to have the throne of his father David. 
all of the promises of what the Jews were hoping in and anticipating are going to come through this woman, Mary. And three times, this text emphasizes that she's a virgin. Why does the text emphasize so much that she was a virgin? And you notice that there's nothing in this text about uh, people being born sinful unless they happen to be born from a virgin. There's nothing like that in this text. Instead, what's happening here in verse 35 is that he's going to be born of a virgin, therefore the child to be born shall be called holy, the son of God. This is showing that Jesus' origins come from God. They didn't come from two human unions or something like that. His, his origins come from God, and that's why he can be both son of man, son of God, and you got that idea there given in the text in verse 35. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that, that you're in this scene. And in this scene, you've got some angel named Gabriel that's dispatched to Nazareth. And we're not told about this heavenly meeting. There's times like in the book of Job where God will have this heavenly council and we don't get all the details of how all that works. Uh, was there some kind of heavenly council? And then Gabriel's, okay, I'm going to go over here now. He goes to this place named Nazareth. And you notice that Luke, as he writes this, he has to explain to Theophilus where this place is. It's a city of Galilee named Nazareth. You've probably never heard of it. It's not in the Old Testament. The rabbis never wrote about these things. Josephus never wrote about this place. This place is really not very important by earthly metrics. So in the heavenly realm, there's a lot of, I think, focus on, well, what's going to happen in this place that nobody on earth would have very much concern for. And you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe by accident. Hey, Belinda, good to see you. Maybe by accident, there's a um, really important person that's in this place. Uh, and, and, but that's really not the case either. There's just this woman named Mary that's betrothed or engaged to a man uh, from the tribe of David. And if we didn't ever have the angel come to this woman, Mary, she would have been another woman in history that got married, that had some kids, that died, and there's no record of her because she would have been so unimportant. But instead, this angel comes to her, and he comes to her and he says, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Can you imagine, like, did he knock on the door, just burst open the door? What form did he come in? I don't know all the details to all of that. But when he says this to her, the text says that she's greatly troubled or she's shaken. Like, imagine her shaking, and she's trying to discern what kind of greeting this might be. You know, I, I don't know what that means, uh, is there like a list of five different sorts of greetings that angels give? And is, is it this kind or is it that kind? I'm not sure. Or is she going, is this like a real thing that I'm really seeing? What, what's the purpose of what all this is? And as she's perplexed, Gabriel continues to speak and he says, don't fear. By the way, have you ever had a time before where somebody began something by saying, hey, don't be afraid, but, and as soon as you say that, what starts to happen to you? You get afraid. And so uh, don't be afraid, but... You're going to conceive and bear a son and call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be son of the Most High. What is Mary thinking when she's hearing all of this? Look, you imagine the look on her face. I, this is the last thing I expected. Why is an angel coming and talking to me about this? She's got a good question. How will this be since I am a virgin? Um, you know, she understands how conception happens. We're not married. How, how is this going to happen? I'll say more about that question in a little bit. And Gabriel gives this answer. Well, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, he's got a really nifty way of just being able to overshadow you. He's going to overshadow you. And like, oh, okay, cool. That makes sense now. In Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God is involved in creation in Genesis chapter 1. Now the Spirit of God is involved in new creation here by giving life to this womb that has no life in it. And, and if Mary has any other questions about this, the angel continues to say, by the way, if this is really, really crazy to you, do you know that there's other people that you know pretty well that are also experiencing pregnancies right now? Like, there, this is not the first miraculous thing that's happened in the last few months because in Luke chapter 1, verse 24, it says about Elizabeth, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she kept herself hidden. I think that this is the first time Mary's heard about Elizabeth's pregnancy. She's kept herself in hiding. 
What, what do you say? Elizabeth is pregnant too? They were old and barren. How could that be the case? Well, here you go, Mary. Here's some extra evidence that what, can, what I just said is going to happen to you is going to happen because everything's possible with the Lord. I love her response to all of this. She says, I'm a servant of the Lord. And she says one of these statements that I have not spent enough time appreciating in verse 38. Let it be to me according to your word. I want to come back to that statement in just a little bit. But that's the scene of the first thing that we read about Mary in the New Testament. How many of you feel like you can relate to this text? And you've ever had a time before? Yeah, I remember that one time that that angel came to me, and he said that all these things were, and you're like, yeah, I know exactly what it's like to be Mary. Let's try to think about this deeper and see if we can all try to relate to her in some way. What is Mary's mission in this text? Her purpose. We're talking about our purpose in these first three lessons. What's her mission? Her mission in this text is to have Jesus formed within her. There's a couple times in, in verse 32 and in verse 35 that God is called the Most High. And what's happening in this text is the Most High is becoming the Most Low. By coming into the form of a human being through somebody that has no earthly importance. There's a hymn by somebody named William Billings that I've never, we've never, I've never sung with any Christians before, but I like the lyrics. And it, the song is called uh, The Shepherd's Carol. And part of the hymn says, Seek not in courts or palaces, nor royal curtains draw, but search the stable, see your God extended on the straw. The Most High becoming the most low, being formed in this person that the world has no concern with. Um, C.S. Lewis has a quote that I think relates to what we're looking at here. That for Jesus to be formed in Mary proves that he is the most high. It proves how great he is. Look at this quote from C.S. Lewis. Everywhere the great enters the little, its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. In the Christian story, God comes down, down from the heights of absolute being, into time and space, down into humanity. All right, what does this mean? One of the ways that you know how great something is, is if it can descend down to something. So, I grew up with way too many dogs, and I'm never going to have another dog again. But if, if I did, and I made a foolish decision, and I bought another one, um, I, could, I could play like a dog with my new dog that I'll never have. I could get down on its level and act like a dog, but my dog could never talk philosophy with me. Do you know why that's the case? I don't mean to boast, but it would be because I am greater than my dog. I can go down and descend to the dog, but the dog cannot come up to me. The reason being is because of my superiority. Why is it that God can be formed in somebody like Mary? Because he's infinitely greater than any human being, but he's choosing by his grace to come into this person. Now, is there anything in the New Testament that says something about Christ being formed in every Christian? Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. In the context, there are false teachers in the city of Galatia that are pulling the Christians away from their purpose and from uh, just strictly following what Jesus has said. And Paul says that there, he has this anguish, that, he, that, that Christ is supposed to be formed within you guys, and you guys are being led astray by various different sorts of things. But why is it the case that we come together and we do lectureships like this? And why is it the case that we come together and we study the Bible? Is it so we can get a check mark and feel like we're religious and that we're good people? What we're trying to do is have Christ formed within us. Every time we get challenged, every time we have our toes stepped on, every time we've got a conversation where somebody rebukes us or corrects us about something in our character, what's happening is trying to have Christ formed within us. And it's not just that Mary has Christ formed within us. It's going to be through Mary that Jesus is brought into the world. Uh, you, you, that hymn, He Has No Hands But Our Hands, and all that. And there's things about that hymn that I don't like because God is not limited to us. But there's a sentiment to that song that has some degree of truth. 
that God has chosen to represent himself through his body, his people. I became a Christian when I was 19, and I, I grew up in a family that did not believe in God or, or the, the, the Bible, and we didn't honor that. We didn't grow up thinking about those kinds of things. And um, when I started hanging out with, with real Christians, I started seeing people that were like loving and kind and even though they had told me about some of their difficulties in life, there was something about their heart and their demeanor that I had never seen in anybody before. You know why that happened? And Chip, you know those people up there, and Christy, and Reagan. Um, the reason that those people were that way is because what they were concerned with more than anything else was having Jesus formed within them. And when they had Jesus formed within them, what they brought to the world was not their political views. It was not their favorite cars. It wasn't their favorite restaurants. It was Christ. Not that we didn't have some of those conversations about the food because um, we enjoy those things together, you know. Um, but, okay, so you see that that's her mission. Christ formed within you, bring Jesus into the world. Now, let me ask this question. What kind of person does God use to have Jesus formed within them and to bring himself into the world? What kind of person does he use? He uses virgins. That's all he's ever used, and that's all he will ever use. Do you guys get what I mean by that? Does that make sense? Or do you want me to expand on that? Um, <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3 for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Notice that Paul says, I, I kind of like got you guys connected, and I want you to be presented as a pure virgin to Christ, or Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, it is those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, referring to the 144,000. Notice the imagery of virgin. This is obviously not a literal kind of thing. It's a metaphor. Here's the picture of the scriptures. When you're baptized into Christ, you are now betrothed. And if I can just say it this way, because I think this is the imagery of the Bible, the consummation's not till he returns. But right now, we're in the betrothal stage. And in the betrothal stage, our responsibility is to not cheat on him, to not commit idolatry, like Brent talked about with Deuteronomy 32. Moses went up on the mountain, and they got really impatient. Jesus has gone up to the heavenly Jerusalem, and in like manner, we better not get impatient. We better not be led astray by all kinds of other things like wealth or education or sports or other things that are not inherently wrong, but they can become wrong when they mean too much to us. Ask yourself, what are you bringing forth into the world? What are the things that you're most passionate to share? What are the things that you're most passionate that other people would become convinced of? That is telling you what's being formed within you. Do you feel like you can relate to her a little bit more? Same mission. But, but let me bring up something else here. When Mary is given this mission, she's got a question. And the question in verse 34 is, how will this be since I am a virgin? And some people might say, all right, well, the reason that Mary had a question like that, uh, well, let me say it this way first. People might reject or neglect the fact that she asked that question. Because somebody might say, well, in this time period, people were just really super superstitious and they would believe miracles more readily and that sort of thing and here's mary and she's like uh how and if you were to ask mary hey mary why do you believe in the virgin birth i may, what would she say well because it happened to me i guess like i i i wasn't sure how all of this could have happened and dr luke is the one writing about this and doctors know about this but everybody else knows about how conception happens as well but she's asking this question how will this be since i'm a virgin now i want you to contrast this with the question that zachariah asks earlier in luke chapter one when he was told that in his old age him and his wife would have a kid he says how shall i know this for i'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years do you remember what happens to zachariah Keep your mouth closed until that child's born. You can't talk because people who have doubts like that better not be trying to talk about God's things because they're going to do damage and, and your voice is going to be opened up and then you'll be, it'll be a big sign and everything like that about your son John. Why is it the case that Mary is treated better than Zachariah was? They're asking like 
the same question. Uh, I, I've talked with a lot of people in the last few years that grew up in Christian families that uh, say that they're having struggles with their faith. And they've got questions. And I'll go, okay, well, what questions do you have? Well, how could a good and loving God allow evil and suffering in the world? How, how could a loving God command that the Canaanites be wiped out? Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of Christians not taking serving God very seriously, and, I, and I, how can I associate with people like this? Have you ever talked to people that say, I'm struggling? My question back to them is, okay, how have you been struggling? What, in other words, what have you been doing to try to find answers to your questions? Oh, I, I talked, I, did, I, I looked something up on Google one time. Okay, that doesn't sound like a struggle to me. If you're going to say that you're struggling, you better be struggling. Otherwise, don't use that word. When Mary asks this question, she's struggling in the right direction. She's going, okay, I believe that this can happen, but can you give me some more uh, ideas on this? When Zechariah asks his question, he's going, no, there's no way this could happen. Mary's going, okay, interesting. Tell me how this could happen. Okay, apply this to our mission. If you're supposed to have Christ formed within you, and you come and you hear something like, you better get anger out of your life now. And I better be careful too. Uh, you better get envy or gossip or jealousy. These deeper character kinds of things, like those are the kind of sermons we don't want to hear. Those are like the non-check markable things. They're more on a spectrum and they're really hard to measure and they make me really, really uncomfortable. And so we don't like talking about those sorts of things. Have you ever had a time before where you heard something or you read something in the Bible or somebody said to you, you've got to over overcome this character problem of yours? Okay. Are you going to be Mary or Zechariah? Okay. How can I overcome this? I've struggled with this for a long time. I think God can, can help me with this, but, but how do I do this? Or, no, I grew up this way and there's no way that it's ever going to change. How could that ever happen? When you think about what your mission is, having Christ formed within you and bringing Christ into the world by your godly conduct and by your desire to try to reach other people with the gospel, we can be either Mary or Zechariah. And if we're Zechariah, then we're, we're going to be very ineffective and we're not actually struggling. What question are you asking? When Mary is given the answer that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and there's other miracles already happening, her response is so encouraging where she says, let it be to me according to your word. That's something that should be written down, tattooed on your arm, something that you should recite. This is a marvelous statement. Let it be to me according to your word. Do you suppose that when she says that, she anticipates some kickback and she anticipates some shame that's going to happen? I mean, she, everybody knows how conception happens. Later on in Jesus' ministry, this is said to Jesus when he's interacting with some people that don't like him very much. In John chapter 8, verse 41, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. I wonder if when they say that, they say, hey, Jesus, nobody knows who your father is because we all know the story about Mary. That's all a fairy tale. We know who our father is. Mary, when she says, let it be to me according to your word, I think she's calculating and thinking through. This is going to mean social shame. This is gonna, and if this is what God wants, if this is his will, then let it be to me according to his word. In the book of Acts, You've got different sufferings that the Christians went through. They're filled with new wine. The apostles are arrested for preaching the gospel. Stephen is stoned. James is killed. Paul has to uh, flee Damascus through a basket. We shouldn't be surprised if in our pursuit of having Christ formed within us and bringing him into the world, we're going to experience shame. I'll never forget April 3rd, 2008, the day I was baptized. My mom's car wasn't working that day, so I had to drive her to work. And I told her, I'm, uh, I'm going to be baptized today. And she said, what? She calls my dad Well, I'm driving her to work, and she puts him on speakerphone, and they're both telling me that this is not a good idea. We don't know why you're doing any of this kind of thing. I say, I'm going to do it anyways. I drop her off at work, and then I go to, to be baptized, and then after that, I go to work for like six hours. And the whole time at work, I've got a big smile because I've been forgiven and I'm a child of God now and I, I've been loved in a way that I've, I've never known I could be. 
I, get, I punch the clock, I drive in my car back home, my mom and dad, who never turned the TV off, turned the TV off. And they said, sit on that couch and tell us what you did today. I said, well, I was uh, baptized. Oh, why did you do that? Uh, because I saw in the Bible that I needed to do that to be forgiven, and I wanted to be forgiven. Oh, okay, so we haven't done that, so do you think that we're going to hell? Day one. I've known friends that have gone through much worse than that, and we have the choice, we have the ability to say, let it be to me according to your word, or let it be to me according to my word. This mission of bringing Christ into the world is what helps people realize who the Lord is. It's what helped me, in part, realize who the Lord is. And there's people in Nashville, there's people in Bowling Green that are in darkness, that want to come to the light, and shame on us if we're unwilling to experience some flack when we consider how important this mission is. When she says, let it be to me according to your word, her son later on would say something kind of similar to this. In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I wonder where she learned some, or he learned some of that kind of thing. I wonder how much Jesus learned from his mom and dad. I don't know the answer to that kind of thing. But I know that Mary had the kind of faith that said, let come what may, your will is what matters more than anything else. Is that true for you? Is the Lord's will more important to you than even your life? Would you be willing to risk your health for the Lord? Would you be willing to risk some friends for the Lord? Would you be willing to risk losing some family member relationships for the Lord? There's no mission that's greater but when we take it seriously, it's going to come to us at great cost. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at some other things regarding our purpose. And I hope that in these first three lessons of this series that we'll be thinking about our purpose in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about before. I want to bring up some, in, some, some imagery from Scripture that has helped me. And so tomorrow, we're going to be looking at some things in Ezekiel chapter 47. But I thank you for your good attention tonight. Look forward to spending the rest of this time with you.